Genesis chapter 29. Genesis 29, if you'll turn there. Genesis 29. I'll ask you a question. It's kind of a rhetorical question, but I think we, we'd all agree. How many has ever felt like something happened to you and you thought to yourself, I didn't deserve that? It felt so unwarranted. It felt so unfair. It wasn't right. How dare they do that? It was unjustifiable. And you found yourself dealing with this, looking at what was taking place. And you're just in your head saying to yourself, how did this happen? How did we get here? I didn't deserve this. This is not right. Anyone? Genesis 29. Speaking on a message that I've simply entitled unwarranted unwarranted beginning at verse 14 it says this beginning in this middle of the chapter verse it says after Jacob had stayed with Laban for about a month Laban said to him you shouldn't work for me without pay just because we are relatives tell me how much your wages should be now Laban had two daughters the older daughter was named Leah and the younger one was Rachel and there was no sparkle in Leah's eyes, but Rachel had a beautiful figure and a lovely face. And since Jacob was in love with Rachel, he told her father, I'll work for you for seven years if you'll give me Rachel, your younger daughter, as a wife. Agreed, Laban replied. I'd rather give her to you than to anyone else. Stay and work with me. So Jacob worked seven years to pay for Rachel. But his love for her was so strong that it seemed to him but just a few days. Isn't that sweet? Finally, the time came for him to marry her. And I, he, Jacob said to Laban, I have fulfilled my agreement. Now give me my wife so I can marry her. So Laban invited everyone in the neighborhood and prepared a wedding feast. But that night, when it was dark, Laban took Leah to Jacob and he slept with her. Verse 25. But when Jacob woke up in the morning, it was Leah. What have you done to me? Jacob raged at Laban. I worked seven years for Rachel. Why have you tricked me? And Laban replied, it is not our custom here to marry off a younger daughter ahead of the firstborn. I'll stop right there for now. This story is a story that reminds me that not everything that we face or everything that we do or everything we plan goes the way we think it's going to go. That sometimes our expectations aren't the way things turn out to be. I, uh, I read this story on the internet and now. They say this story is true. I tried to verify the story, but there's no way to verify it. Even Snopes can't verify the story is true. But it's so good, so funny, that I want to go ahead and read it because it actually makes the point. It's about a farmer who decided that he was going to rope a deer. I want you to hear this story. The farmer wrote this. He says, I had this idea that I was going to rope a deer, put it in a stall, and feed it on corn for a couple of weeks, then kill it and eat it. The first step in this adventure was getting a deer. I figured that since they congregate at my cattle feeder and do not seem to have much fear of me when we are there, a bull one will even come right up to me only four feet away, it should not be difficult to rope one, so to get up to it and toss a bag over its head, to calm it down, then hog tie it and transport it home. So I filled the cattle feeder, then hid down at the end with my rope. The cattle, having seen the rope thing before, stayed well back. They were not having any of it. But after about 20 minutes, my deer showed up, three of them, and I picked one out, stepped out from the end of the feeder, and threw, uh, threw my rope over it, and the deer just stood and stared at me. I wrapped the rope around my waist, and I twisted the end so that I would have a good hold. The deer just still stood and stared at me, but you could tell it was mildly concerned about the whole rope situation. I took a step towards it, and it took a step back. I put a little tension on the rope, and then I received an education. <laughs> the first thing I learned is that while a deer may just stand there looking at you funny while you rope it, they are spurred to action when you start pulling on that rope. The deer exploded. The second thing I learned is that pound for pound, a deer is a lot stronger than a cow or a colt. A cow or a colt in that weight range, I could fight down with a rope with some dignity. A deer 
no chance. That thing ran and bucked and twisted and pulled, and there was no controlling it, and certainly no getting close to it. As it jerked me off my feet and started dragging me across the ground, it occurred to me that having a deer on a rope was not nearly as good of an idea as I had originally imagined. The only upside is that they do not have the stamina as other animals. A brief 10 minutes later, I, it was tired and not nearly as quick to jerk me off my feet and drag me, and I managed to get up. It took me only a few minutes to realize this since I was mostly blinded by the blood flowing out of the big gash in my head. At that point, I had lost my taste for corn-fed venison, and I just wanted to get that devil creature off the end of my rope. I figured if I just let the rope, uh, left the rope hanging around its neck, it would likely die a slow painfully somewhere. And at that time, there was no love at all between me and the deer. And at that moment, I hated the thing, and I would venture to guess that the, that the feeling was mutual. So despite the gash in my head and several large knots where I cleverly arrested the deer's momentum by bracing my head against a rock, I could still think clearly enough to recognize that there was a small chance that I shared a tiny amount of responsibility for what we were facing. So I didn't want to have the deer suffer a slow death, so I managed to get it in line back up between my truck and the feeder like a trap, like a squeeze chute. I got it back in there, and I started moving up so I could get my rope back. Then he writes, did you know that deer bite? <laughs> they do. I never in a million years would have thought that a deer would bite somebody, so I was very surprised when it reached up there and it grabbed, to grab the rope that the deer grabbed a hold of my wrist. Now, when a deer bites you, it's not like being bit by a horse when they just bite and let go. A deer bites you and shakes its head almost like a pit bull. It bites hard and it hurts. The proper thing he says to do when a deer bites you is to probably to freeze and draw back slowly. I tried screaming and shaking instead. My method was ineffective. It seems like the deer was biting and shaking for several minutes, but it was likely only several seconds. But I, being smarter than the deer, though you may be doubting that by now, tricked it. While it was busy tearing the tendons out of my right arm, I reached up with my left hand and pulled the rope loose. That was when I got my final lesson in deer behavior for the day. Deer will strike you with their front feet. They rear right up on their back feet and strike about head and shoulder level, and their hooves are surprisingly sharp. I learned a long time ago that when an animal like a horse strikes at you with their hooves and you can't get away easily, the best thing to do is try to make a loud noise and make an aggressive move towards the animal. This will usually cause them to back down so you can escape. This was not a horse. This was a deer. So obviously, the trick did not work. In the course of a millisecond, I devised a different strategy. I screamed like a woman and tried to turn and run. The reason I'd always been told not to turn and try and run from a horse that paws at you is that there's a good chance that it'll hit you in the back of the head. Deer are not so much different than a horse. Besides being twice as strong, three times as evil, because the second I turned to run, it hit me right behind the back of the head and it knocked me down. Now, when a deer paws at you and knocks you down, it does not immediately leave. I suspect that it does not recognize that the danger has passed. What they do instead is they paw at your back and they jump up and down on top of you while you're laying there crying like a little girl covering your head. I finally managed to crawl underneath my truck and the deer went away. He concluded by saying this, I now know why people go deer hunting with a rifle and a scope. They're trying to even out the odds. What's the point of the story? Well, it's, it's not that you don't try to rope a deer. The point of the story is that sometimes life smacks you in the face. And sometimes no matter what you plan, now what you think it's going to be, that it's going to happen this way, it's going to go this way or that way, Something happens totally different, totally unexpected, and sometimes it feels like it was unwarranted. It's not justifiable. What, the, what they did, it's not right. It's not fair. That's for all people, and that includes God's people. And we see that in the story of Jacob and Laban, that even Christian people Godly people, because sometimes facing life moments that take them off guard. Moments that, if we're being honest, make us feel like this was unwarranted, unjustified, 
and not, not fair. See, in Genesis chapter 29, you begin to read the beginning of the chapter. You read about Jacob leaving his father and mother, Isaac and Rebekah, and going to the land of his ancestors, to his mother's brother's house, a man by the name of Laban. Now, Jacob was going there for two reasons. The first reason, it was because he was fleeing for his life because his brother Esau was out to kill him. And the reason his brother Esau was out to kill him is because he had stolen his brother's birthright. If you remember the story, Genesis 25, verse 34, it says that Esau showed contempt for his rights as the firstborn, and he verbally traded away his birthright for a cup of stew. He had been hunting. He comes back in. He's hungry. Jacob's making stew. It smells good. He says, give me some. And Jacob says, you sell me your birthright. You give it to me. I'll give you some of this stew. And so Esau says, fine, you can have it. It doesn't matter. It means nothing to me right now because if I die, what good would it do me? And so he says, you can have my birthright. Give me the stew. But the reality was is that Esau never dreamt that his father Isaac would bless Jacob. He knew his father Isaac. He knew the relationship that they had, and he was confident that no matter what he had said to Jacob, that he would get the birthright blessing from his father, the blessing that would say, you got my property, you would become the head of the family, you are the next patriarch in line. But here's the deal. Jacob and Esau's mother, Rebekah, favored es Jacob more than Esau. And she, with the help of Isaac's poor eyesight, deceived Isaac, made him think that it was Esau when it was really Jacob. And he ended up giving Jacob the first right blessing. It's a real tragic story if you go and read it because Isaac's so, so full. And he keeps saying, you, you don't sound like my son, but you feel like him. You don't smell like him, but you, you must be him. And he gives him the birthright blessing. And some of the saddest scriptures in the Bible are found in Genesis chapter 27. When finally Esau comes in and he's waiting for the blessing. And Isaac realizes what's happened. And he says to him in verse 37, Isaac said to Esau, I've made Jacob your master. And I've declared that all of his brothers will be his servants. I have guaranteed him an abundance of grain and wine. What is left for me to give to you, my son? And Esau pleaded, but do you have only one blessing? Oh, my father, bless me too. And then Esau broke down and wept. And it's in that moment you have this realization in Esau's mind of what Jacob has done. And he vows, I'm going to kill him. If I see Jacob, he's dead. I'll kill that brother of mine because he stole my blessing. So Jacob flees. That was one of the reasons the second reason he had gone there is because his father and mother never wanted him to take a wife from amongst the Canaanite people. But he told him when it was time to take a wife, you're to go back to your ancestors, to your father and mother's people, and there to take a wife. So that was the second reason he'd gone there to find a wife. And the Bible says that he goes and he's at a well, a well where they, the shepherds would come and water all of their flocks. And Rachel, the youngest daughter of Laban, shows up because she was a shepherd. And when he saw her, he said to himself, Woo, she's the one. I remember sitting in the sixth grade Sunday school class years ago, 1977. I'm sitting in the classroom. Sister Virginia Tatum was our teacher. That's how good I can remember this. And all of a sudden, a young lady comes walking in wearing a rabbit fur coat. And I said to her, I said, mm, she's the one. It's Debbie Davidson, that's my wife. <laughs> Going all the way back to sixth grade. I had to chase her a long time. I don't think it was that happened right then. Like that deer, I was trying to wear it down. Wear her down. That's Jacob at the well. He sees Rachel, and he's so captivated by her that he says, she's the one. And it says in verse 13 that, after Jacob had stayed with Laban for about a month, Laban said to him, you shouldn't work for me without pay because we are relatives. Tell me what your wages should be. And basically, Jacob says, give me your daughter, Rachel. I'll take her. But it says here that Laban had two daughters. The older daughter was named Leah, and the younger one was Rachel. And that there was no sparkle, it says, in Leah's eyes. But Rachel had a beautiful figure and a lovely face. You know what that modern translation would say of that? It would say this, that Rachel was good looking and Leah wasn't. That's a modern translation of basically what, we're, what it's trying to say here. It would say that Rachel is being featured on Glamour magazine and Leah's working somewhere in a back dark room somewhere. That's the essence of this. That's the implication. 
It says, but since Jacob was in love with Rachel, she had a lovely, beautiful figure and a lovely face that he told her father, I'll work for you for seven years if you'll give me Rachel, your younger daughter, as my wife. And Laban said, agreed. So Jacob worked seven years to pay for Rachel. But his love for her was so strong that it seemed to him for but a few days. And finally the time came to marry her. And Jacob said to Laban, I have fulfilled my agreement. Now give me my wife so I can marry her. Think about this. He's so in love. Guys, imagine you had to work seven years for your father-in-law before he allowed you to marry her. Some of you are thinking about that. If I would have required that of Pastor Johnny sitting back there, he would have two more years to work for me before he could marry Haley. But then I wouldn't have Grayson and Evelyn, so it's okay. I'll give him a pass. But that's what Jacob was willing to do to marry Rachel. He was willing to work for her father for seven years. But now seven years have passed, and he goes to Laban and says, All right, it's time. I want to marry Rachel. Give me my bride. And Laban says, Perfect. I'll arrange everything. So he puts together this big feast, suffice everybody in the neighborhood according to the custom of the day. And then after a night of celebration, he takes Lab Jacob to his tent where the couple's supposed to spend their first night together, and he's there waiting the arrival of his bride. And unknowingly to Jacob, because it's dark, because Leah is wearing a veil, Laban does the unthinkable, and he brings Leah instead of Rachel. And obviously, Leah didn't say anything all night. She had to be in on the plan. Rachel's probably being kept back somewhere. And Leah's in on what's taking place. All I know is that somehow, in some way, they consummate their relationship. And it was not until morning when Jacob wakes up and realizes that Leah's the one in the tent cooking breakfast that he's been duped. You talk about being wronged. Jacob was wronged royally. He had worked for seven years to marry the girl of his dreams, his cover girl model, and instead he got her sister Leah. So he runs to Laban, and the Bible says he's in a rage. And you can imagine how mad and angry and upset he is. And he says to me, verse 25, what have you done to me? I worked for seven years for Rachel. Why have you tricked me? What is he saying to him? He's saying to him, what you did to me was unwarranted. It's unjustifiable and it's unfair. I did this for you and still you did this to me. It's not right. We've all had those moments in life and those experiences dealing with, with others, with people, and we say to ourselves, what they did is not right, it's not fair, it's not justifiable. I did this, and look what they did to me. He's saying that he didn't deserve it. He's saying what he did was baseless, unfounded, and it's not fair. What did Laban say back to him? He said, it's not our custom to marry off your younger daughter ahead of the firstborn. What he's simply saying is this, that there are some things in life that are what they are. So you're just going to have to deal with it. That even the best laid plans don't always come about. He's telling him that sometimes life, no matter what you think of it, it's still not fair. And it's a true statement. It feels that way so many times. I heard about two actresses walking down a famous boulevard in Paris, France. They're wearing real expensive designer dresses. And they're just walking along, strolling down the streets of Paris. And all of a sudden, one of those pigeons comes flying in and just splatters one of them. <laughs> and her friend that's with her, she was thinking that the lady is going to just blow up and freak out and just start yelling. But she didn't stop walking. She didn't do anything. You know what she simply said? She says, for some people, birds sing. <laughs> and that's all she said. <laughs> what is she saying? She's saying, life's not fair. For some people, birds sing. For others, they make a mess. That's what she's trying to say. And it doesn't sometimes feel like it's right. 
Listen, I've learned through living that you can seemingly do all the right things. You can make all the right plans and still not have things work out the way you thought it should. How many of you have heard this before? I exercised, I ate right, and I still got heart disease. I helped my kids study for that final exam. We spent hours preparing all week long, and they still failed. I worked hard at that company. I was faithful to that company. I never missed a day. I did everything they expected. But when it came time for a promotion, time to move into management, they looked at somebody else with less experience and who has never been there as long as I've been there. I was faithful to my spouse. I loved them and cared for them, and still they left me. Or how about this one? I've served God all my life. And still I have problems at home, problems with the family, problems with my health, problems with my finances, problems here, problems there. Listen, the reality is this. Even when we're serving God faithfully, things can still happen that feel unwarranted, unjustified, and unfair. Philip Yancey, who is a great Christian author, he wrote a book to this, about this very problem. It's entitled Disappointment with God. And he says this in the book. He says, when something grossly unfair happens in our lives, many Christians are quick to blame God. And it's true. When things don't go our way, we want the first thing we cry, foul! It's like playing ball at the basket at the the park. You're going to shoot the ball and somebody hits you on the wrist and hits you on the hand and the ball misses the goal altogether, clanks off the rim. You say, Foul! What are you saying? It's not right. You messed up a shot. I would have made it, but you did this. Foul. Listen, when things like that happen, we're, we're, we're always looking to blame somebody because what? somebody's got to blame somebody because this isn't right. And too many times, Christian people want to blame God. I remember years ago, a wide receiver by the name of Stevie Johnson playing for the Buffalo Bills. They were playing the, the Pittsburgh Steelers in a, in, a, in a playoff game, if I remember correctly. And it was overtime. And the quarterback threw Johnson what would have been the winning touchdown pass. And he dropped it. And after the game, he tweeted how he blamed God that he dropped the pass. He did. He tweeted this. He says, I praise you 24-7, exclamation point, five, six times. And this is how you do me, exclamation point, four times. You expect me to learn from this, question mark, three times. How, question mark, question mark, exclamation point, three times. He says, I'll never forget this, exclamation, exclamation, ever, exclamation, exclamation. To him, it wasn't right. To him, it was unwarranted, unjustified, and unfair. So why? Because he dropped the ball. Somebody had to blame. So it had to be God's fault. We've all been there. We've all had moments in life where we felt like we haven't been treated rightly. That what's happened to us is unwarranted. Something we did not deserve. And unfortunately, some of us have blamed God for what's happened. God should have stopped it. God could have kept it from happening. God could have opened up that guard. God could have done this. God could have done that. Because this didn't happen. It's God's fault. Listen, I read in the New Testament about John the Baptist being in prison. Because he had spoken out against Herod's illicit relationship with his brother's wife. And Jesus is seemingly going through ministry unscathed. And, and so it's just kind of bothering John. Because now he's in prison. Now he's languishing. Now he's suffering. And yet Jesus is still out doing what he's doing. And so he actually sends a couple of his disciples to go to find Jesus. And, and he wants to ask, ask him a question. Luke seven nineteen. He says, are you the Messiah we've been expecting? Or should we be looking for somebody else? And it sounds so strange to think that this is John who's writing this. John who baptized Jesus in the Jordan River. Luke three twenty two. who heard God speak as the heavens opened up. This is my dearly loved son who brings me for great joy. This is John in John one twenty nine, who said of Jesus, he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And yet here he is, he's imprisoned. It doesn't feel right. It feels unwarranted, unjustified, unfair that he's in prison and Jesus is still doing what he's doing after all that he had done for him. 
And so he sends these disciples to him to ask the question. Listen, the question today for us is this. What do we do in life when the things that are happening to us and around us feel unjust? What do we do in life when the things that are happening to us feel unjust, unwarranted, and unfair? I'm going to give you two things real quickly. Two things we're to do. One, don't blame God. Two, but turn to God. Don't blame God, but turn to God. Don't do this, but do this. So many times we're quick to do this. God is your fault. And all of my friends, that's what John the Baptist is doing here. He's not doing this, he's doing this. He's not necessarily blaming Jesus for his circumstances, even though he doesn't understand them. He's not lashing out at Jesus, begrudging Jesus. Instead, he's looking to Jesus. He didn't blame God, he turned to God. And so he sends these disciples. Why? Because he's looking for confirmation of who Jesus is so he can help him to understand why he's having to walk through what he's walking through. Are you the one? Are you the Messiah? And I love the fact that Jesus sends back word to him and says, you go back and tell John the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear, the good news is being preached to the poor. You go back and tell him I am who I said I am. Think about Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. I quote that scripture all the time because there are times I don't understand. There are times when there are things that have happened in my life that I say to myself, I didn't deserve that. I did not warrant that. That's not right. That's unfair. That's unjustified. How, how could they do that? How could they say that? How could they be that? But friends, in those moments, I cannot trust my own thoughts. In those moments, I cannot trust my own judgments. Why? Because in my own thoughts, I'm saying, I don't understand. But rather have to trust in his. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all that you do, and he will show you which path to take. It's Romans 8 that says, and we know that God causes everything to work together for good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for him. He's not saying here that everything is going to be good. He's not saying that everything is going to be perfect or go our way or even be fair. But what he is saying that God, because of who he is, he can take everything in our lives, including those things that are unwarranted, unfair and unjustifiable, and he can bring good out of them. So don't blame God, turn to God. As Peter said, where else can we go? Only you have the words of eternal life. Where else can we go? So don't blame God. Turn to God. And secondly, don't blame God. Keep trusting God and stay the course. In other words, we just keep doing what we've always been doing in following Jesus. Heard about a farmer who had decided that he was just going to pack a lunch, take his fishing rod, and go fishing in this backwater stream for some trout. It had been a real rough year of farming. Drought had pretty much killed his crop. The year before, the heavy rains had killed his crop. The real, real year before, a lot of imports had basically driven down the price so much that here, after three bad years in a row, He's thinking to himself, I don't know that I'm going to farm anymore. And he just needed to get away to contemplate what it is he was supposed to do. So he goes and he gets to this backwater stream. And he comes to a place where the, the stream is actually kind of split to this little trivulet going this way. And little trout are swimming through some fear. And he's fishing, catches a few trout, gets out his lunch, and just lays on the bank eating his lunch. And as he's sitting there eating, eating his lunch, he notices a beaver come out of the woods, and it goes him down into that little trivulet that breaks off the main stream branch there, and he drags a stick into the stream. Then he disappears, and he comes back, and he brings another branch. 
disappears, and he comes back, and he brings another branch. And he's watching this, and it's interesting just to watch this little beaver working. And, but the water pressure against the branches finally push the branches, and they flow on down the stream. But guess what? The beaver goes and gets another branch and brings it in. Goes and gets another branch and brings it in. Gets another branch, a third and a fourth branch. He's bringing it in. And he's, the farmer's just watching all this happen. But about that time, a brown bear comes out as the beaver's gone, and he's looking for trout down in the stream, and he's trying to swat at some trout, and as he's swatting at some trout, he hits the branches that this beaver's plague taking in place, and there goes the branches down the stream. The bear leaves, the beaver comes back, here comes a branch, one branch, two branch, three branch, four branch, and he disappears again, and the farmer decided he's just going to have fun with this and so he waves out into the stream himself and he pulls the branches loose just to see what the beaver will do and sure enough the beaver comes back one branch two branch three branch five until finally he had built up a little dam and the stream began to pull up into a little quiet pond and with that the farmer got up packed up his lunch picked up his rod and reel and went back to his house to continue to farm. That's what I see taking place with Jacob and Laban in Genesis 29. Jacob cries, foul! It's not right. It's unwarranted. It's unjustifiable. It's unfair. I agreed to work for seven years for Rachel and you give me Leah. But Laban replies, it's not our custom here to marry off a younger daughter ahead of the firstborn. And then he says to him, but wait until the bridal week is over. And then we'll give you Rachel too, provided you promise to work another seven years for me. So Jacob agreed to work seven more years. And a week after Jacob married Leah, Laban gave him Rachel too. Laban told Jacob, if you'll just keep doing what you're doing, if you'll be patient and agree to work for me for another seven years in a week, I want to give you Rachel as well. Listen, Jacob had done exactly what he agreed to do, and yet Laban had deceived him. And now he's trying to take advantage of him. He says, if you'll work another seven years, and it felt wrong, it felt unwarranted, unjustifiable, it was unfair. And here's the thing, Jacob could have tried to deceive Laban the way he had deceived him. He could have taken Rachel and they could have eloped and he could have left Leah behind and he had been done with them. But that's not what he does. Instead, he consents to Laban's terms and he keeps doing what he'd always been doing. He stays the course and he keeps trusting by faith that God's plans and purposes are going to be carried out in his life no matter what was happening to him or around him. Listen, sometimes life can feel as if everything is going against us. It can be job-related. It can be in relationships. It can be sickness. You know, financial, relational, mental, emotional, spiritual. But it's in those moments that we have to make a decision. Do we run or do we stay? Do we abandon faith do we abandon God or do we stay the course and keep doing what we've always been doing? Trusting in God no matter what. Friends, I submit unto you that we need to be like John the Baptist and like Jacob. We have to keep on trusting and keep on believing and keep on hoping. Things can happen in our lives that are unwarranted, that are unjustifiable, that are unfair. From COVID to cancer to crisis, you name it. But God still loves us. God still cares about us, and he's still in the business of making good come of every situation. I'll tell you this, the most unwarranted, unfair, and justifiable event in human history was when they nailed Jesus Christ to a cross. That's a reality. He did nothing but good. He, he healed the sick. He fed the hungry. He raised the dead. He comforted the destitute, and they still nailed him to a cross and crucified him. But from that unwarranted, unjustifiable, unfair. They killed him for a crime he didn't commit. Yet from that injustice, God redeemed us. All I'm saying, friends, is this. When life seems unfair and when the things that are happening feel unwarranted and unjustified, 
I just keep trusting God. I keep staying the course. I keep reminding myself of the promise of Galatians 6, 9 that simply says this. So let's not get tired of doing what is good or what is right or what is true. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Amen. So we don't blame God, but we turn to God. We don't do this, we do this. We don't blame God, but we keep trusting God and staying the course. And friends, I promise you, you will reap a blessing. If it's not in this life, I know it's in the life to come. Jacob, he worked seven years for Rachel. Seven years. I don't know if you ever thought about how long seven years. Seven years is a long time. You think what's happened in a year. 2020 felt like the longest year ever. Imagine seven years every day. You're tending sheep. You're herding all the things that they had. He was farming all the things for his father for seven years. And every year he's counting down six more years, five more years, four more years, three more years, two more years, one year left, 10 months left, six months left, three months left, one month left, only to be wronged. But you know what? God never wastes anything. He doesn't. Jacob stayed the course, trusting God. He didn't blame God. He stayed the course. And I'm glad God gave him Leah. Jacob, he didn't appreciate it. But do you realize that it was from Leah and not Rachel that God will give us Jesus? I don't know if you ever contemplated that. It's not from Rachel that Jesus descends. It's from Leah. Because Leah will have a son by the name of Judah. And Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Sometimes in the unwarranted, unjustifiable, and unfair things, God brings a blessing into our lives that we could have never fathomed or imagined without it. So when we're facing things, we don't blame God, we turn to God. We don't blame God, we keep trusting God, and we stay the course. And in due season, if we faint not, we shall reap a harvest of blessing. As the New Testament would say that our barns are too small to contain. Hallelujah. Stand together. Jesus, I love you. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I want to our heads bowed and eyes closed real quickly as we close out this service. How many would be honest and say, lift your hand and say, Pastor Larry, I'm walking through something right now that I'm just trusting God to bring me through. Would you just lift your hand up right where you're at? Yeah. There's a lot of us in this room. A lot of us in this room. As you're walking that out, don't blame God, trust God. Stay the course. Keep doing what you always done. And in due season, you'll reap a blessing. God, I pray right now for every person who lifted their hand. God, in life, we'll experience things that don't seem right things that feel unwarranted, things that feel unjustified and unfair. But Lord, we remember what you endured for us. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, you, you didn't worry about the shame. You just, you just endured the cross for the joy that was set before you for us, for our redemption. God, let us to endure let us trust in you, knowing that there's a blessing, a 
that's coming if we're faithful to you. I pray that you would help walk every person through their storm. That you would encourage them and strengthen them and lead them and direct them by your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus. I'm going to open up this altar. I want to give us a chance to find a place of prayer. If you lifted your hand, it's a good time to come and just get before the Lord and say, God, I'm going to trust in you. God, I'm going to trust in you. I'm not going to blame anyone. I'm just going to trust in you. You're, you're my help. You're my source. You're my strength. I'm going to trust in you. Can we do that? God bless you. Amen. Pastor Steve.